Thank you for downloading this video from the National Fire Chiefs Council. I am Ian Marrett, Director of Education and Development for the United Kingdom Rescue Organisation. Lithium ion batteries are not new, they have been around since the 1970s. Fires involving them also isn't new. Remember the video clips from the 90s of mobile phones and laptops exploding? However, what is relatively new is the scope of application, which extends from a smart watch to a mass energy storage system that supports the national grid. This increase in application and volume has predictably led to a rise in the number of fires. These incidents are presenting new challenges to firefighters as the fires are less predictable, more aggressive and often in a challenging environment. The all hazard approach to incidents adopted by the Fire and Rescue Service means that we first gather information to raise our situa situational awareness. This informs objectives and planning and ensures the risks we take are proportional to the benefits. For this approach to be effective, we need to understand what the risks are. We can then reduce them to an acceptable level, therefore safeguarding responders and members of the public. To discuss the risks presented by lithium-ion batteries, I'm joined today by a panel of experts. Here with me in the studio is Steve Halliwell, a station manager from Humberside Fire and Rescue Service. Steve works in the emergency preparedness team and is the has is the service lead for Hazmat and DIM. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Ian. Joining us online, we have Professor Paul Christensen from Newcastle New University. Paul supports a number of lithium ion battery health and safety working groups and is a senior advisor to the NFCC. Also joining us online is Matthew Dedman. Matt is an assistant director for Kent Fire and Rescue Service and is the NFCC lead for alternative fuels and energy systems. Representing operational learning, we have Scott Cameron, who is also a national lead with the NFCC. And finally, we are Joan Bodler, who is a member of the UKRO education team and an instructor at Seven Park Training Centre. Welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. If you don't mind, Paul, let's kick off the discussion with you. Can you provide us with some background information? So what is, what is good about a lithium ion battery? Put simply, lithium ion batteries store a huge amount of energy in a very small space, much, much more than, for example, a lead acid battery, maybe 10 times more. And this makes them so useful in so many different applications. Thanks, Paul. Can you expand on where we might find them both today and in the future? Sure. Well, as well as the personal electronic devices that you've talked about, increasingly they're appearing in personal mobility devices such as e-scooters, e-bikes, as well as electric vehicles, lorries, but also ships, ferries, even light aircraft. And would you believe personal flying taxis and cars? 150 firms across the world are apparently racing to build the first personal flying car. They're also going to appear in trains in the future and increasingly on ships, big ships. And who knows? I mean, uh, the Japanese are building a battery ship, 220 megawatt hour lithium battery to store solar, uh, energy from wind turbines and then take it to shore and deliver it to the grid there. And talking about the grid, increasingly you're going to see big grid scale units and they can be anywhere. They can be outside. They can be on the roof of, of buildings, they can be in the basements, but also we're starting to see an increasing number of lithium battery systems in people's homes to store the electricity from solar panels. And of course, these can actually be quite big from two kilowatt hours right the way up to 130 kilowatt hours. That's bigger than some of the big electric vehicle batteries. Thanks, Paul. That's really useful in, insight. It will provide our viewers uh, with an understanding of the benefits of a lithium ion batteries and give us some indication about um, their scope. Steve, if I can come to you um, sure. now, if I may. Uh, so you've recently attended an incident that involved a lithium ion battery on fire. That's right. Um, could you set the scene for us? Can you give us an overview of uh, what the situation was? Uh, yeah, sure. In a, in a nutshell, it was a Saturday night. Um, we received a call to service for uh, a car fire uh, in Beverly. 
so the local fire station were mobilised with one appliance to attend the car fire um, and I was the hazmat officer on duty at the time. Okay, so let, let's take a look at the first video. Uh, so this is CCTV footage um, from the um, owner of the vehicle's property. Yes. Um, so can you talk us through um, his initial actions and, and what is ha actually happening to the battery? Yeah, sure. As you can see, the owner's there out on the drive. Um, he was uh, alerted to something not being quite right when he heard um, a hissing noise or a series of hissing noises from inside the property. When he came outside, um, you can see him there inspecting the car. Um, the car was on charge at the time, so one of the first things he did was disconnect it from being on charge. And then you can just see there, um, the car's starting to gas off again. Um, so obviously he's concerned, uh, he thinks his car's on fire. It's right next to the house and his other vehicles. So he, he's taken the decision to get in that car and reverse it to a, a, a bigger, more open space on the drive. Um, which is what he's just doing now. Um, as luck would have it for us, it, it puts it right underneath his CCTV camera. Perfect. Um, so it gives us some good footage. Um, so we'll see here, he's, he's reversing it. That's all he does at this stage, and you'll see in a second him getting out the car. He then makes his way back towards the house and when the car, where the car was parked, um, there's some scorch marks, some, some obvious kind of burning impression on the drive there from underneath the car. And then if you just, as he's doing that and walks away, if you just watch the back of the car at this stage. And we can just see the, the gassing off starting again. And that continues gassing off to that extent and then stopping and then there's several minutes of pause and then it'll gas off again and that continues for, for quite some time. So before we look at the next video where we look at the crew's um, initial actions, yeah. um, what information were, there, were they provided with? Did they know, actually know it was an um, electric vehicle that they was attending? So the information they received was pretty limited, um, as it often is. Um, they, they were mobilised to a car fire. There was no further information. Um, there was no specific reference to that being an electrical um, car or a hybrid car. Um, we have since introduced that into our mobilising procedure where those questions will be asked at, at the point of call. But uh, on this occasion, because it was early days, in fact, it was our first incident involving a lithium ion uh, battery in a car. Um, that th they weren't aware of that until they actually arrived on scene. Okay, so Steve, we've got a good indication now of what the crews faced when they uh, first arrived on the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk us through their initial actions? Yeah, so the, it's a local crew, they're an on-call crew, so approximately five minutes to, to mobilise and then a couple of minutes travel time. By the time they arrived at the property, they were faced with the car on the drive with, with no obvious sign of, of fire. Um, you can see from the footage there um, that they've arrived. They, they can smell a strong um, electrical smell in the air. Um, so the, the information gathering to start with, the, the laying out a hose reel, the BA wearers have the BA on the back but, but not started up at this stage. And the officer in charge is just going over to have a conversation with the owner, find out exactly what's, what's happening. Um, meanwhile, they're using the MDT on the appliance to gather information about um, this particular vehicle on, on uh, crash recovery. So um, finding out wh where to isolate battery systems, electrical systems and so on. So all, all that's happening at the minute. And he also takes them over in a minute to the um, burn marks on the drive. Um, which, which they have a look at. So um, they're building up an impression, but as you can see at the minute, um, no sign of fire. Okay, so Steve, um, at this point, uh, the crews now know they're dealing with yep. um, an electric vehicle. Um, I'm assuming because this is relatively new, uh, they've got limited experience of dealing with an incident of this type. Uh, very much so, yes, very limited experience. In fact, this was the first um, incident of its type uh, within our service. So information has gone out prior to that, so they've, they've got some understanding of how to deal with it and what the hazards and risks are, but um, no experience practically. Okay. Paul, can I just bring you in here? Um, so we're seeing from the video that there's a gas cloud. Can you just explain to us what the risks are from that gas cloud? It's extremely dangerous. 
uh, essentially what's happening is that the batteries have gone into what's called thermal runaway. They've started to heat up. The heat has produced gases and more heat. These The heat speeds up the chemical processes, generating even more gases and more heat. The gases coming off will contain maybe 30 to 50 percent hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen cyanide, which is toxic, hydrogen fluoride, which is toxic, hydrogen chloride, as well as uh, small gas molecules like methane and ethane and small droplets of the organic solvent from inside the cells. In other words, what you've got is a vapor cloud. It's a toxic vapor cloud first and foremost, but it's also flammable and potentially explosive. And this is the pre-ignition stage of the electric vehicle. All right, thank you, Paul. Brilliant. So we've got a gas cloud that we now know is toxic and flammable. Um, so what happens next, Steve? Now we can see that the thermal runaway is increasing. So this is leading to a more severe and, and frequent gassing off. Um, so at this point, the officer in charge contacted control and he requested some hazmat advice. Um, this was initially over the telephone uh, and the phone call came in to me. So the advice given was firstly to deal with the tactics that are required to deal with the thermal run runaway and then secondly how to do this safely. So to stop thermal runaway maximum cooling is required. The crew were advised to upgrade from hose reel jets to a main jet uh, and that way they could ensure that continuous cooling was placed directly onto the battery situated underneath the car. In terms of crew safety, breathing apparatus in the vicinity of the car must be worn and as, as we've seen, the, the gassing off, this can be sudden and unpredictable. These gases are not only flammable but highly toxic as we've said. And there's also a risk of a forceful and directional flaming, possibly with the ferocity of a blowtorch. Also, a thermal image camera should be used to monitor the temperature of the battery throughout the incident to gauge whether thermal runaway is either increasing or decreasing. And the thermal image camera should also alert crews to the presence of otherwise inv invisible flames. Um, so hydrogen gas, for example, can burn with an invisible flame. Paul, can I ask you to jump in again here? Could you explain to us um, why, why there is such a big build-up of gas at this point? Well, basically, the, the, the cells, it only takes one cell to go into thermal runaway. And I don't know what kind of cells were present in this particular vehicle, but they can be as small as a, a AA battery, or they can be as big as an A4 sheet of paper and a centimetre thick. Anyway, one, cells go, one cell goes into thermal runaway. The heat that it produces is then transferred to an adjacent cell. That then starts to go into thermal runaway, and this heat propagates from cell to cell. And clearly what happened there is that there was a few cells got hot and went into thermal runaway, and then there was a delay for some reason. And this is quite common that you can have uh, a, a, an incident involving an electric vehicle and the cells don't actually go into thermal runway or apparently don't for hours, days or even weeks after the initial incident. So it's got worse and worse and then the whole volume effectively of the battery has become involved in thermal runaway and you start getting very large volumes of the vapor cloud emitted. I should also point out that if you looked at the beginning of, the, of that video just then, there was also a black cloud. That actually is not gas, it's small particles of the heavy metals from the cathode material being ejected, which is another, obviously, health hazard. As you can see in this clip, the, the gassing off phase has progressed uh, a bit further. We're now starting to get flaming combustion uh, of the gases underneath the car. Um, you can see there the BA team are using a hose reel uh, to try and directly attack the flames uh, and a dry powder extinguisher is also used. Uh, but what we really need at this stage is to get that cooling directly onto the battery underneath the car. The problem is that, as you can see, the access underneath the car um, is, a, is a real challenge. So on this occasion, uh, the car owner had access to a trolley jack. Um, this was later used to tilt the car onto a 20 to 30 degree angle to improve access for the cooling water. Of course, uh, if you're using a jack, any kind of jacking system, uh, you need to make sure that that's going to structural parts of the car uh, and certainly shouldn't be placed where it might further compromise the lithium-ion battery in any way. 
Also, by this stage, we've contacted our scientific advisors uh, for further advice, um, and they've confirmed that the actions so far are, are correct and suitable. Um, and they've also suggested a, a suitable in accordant distance of 15 metres um, with breathing apparatus as the minimum PPE within the cordon. This should be complemented by the, the use of gas detection so that we can ensure that anybody operating outside the cordon area um, remains in a, a safe air environment. So Steve, uh, the crews have now secured a jack, they lifted the vehicle to create better access. Mm. Uh, what happened next? Yeah, so as, as you can see, the car's now on an angle uh, after that jack's been in, put in place. Um, we've also got an improvised monitor now operating using a 45 millimeter jet. Uh, this is directly applying cooling to the battery itself. Um, they've complemented this attack by a uh, hose reel, as you can see, for firefighting to attack that flaming combustion. As a result, though, you can see there's uh, water runoff flowing down the drive, and at the bottom of the drive, the water flows into the drains in the road. Um, in, in this particular area, there's a combined sewer system, meaning that the surface water runoff and foul water are both collected together in the same system and treated as foul. Um, and, and moving forward, you can see, Ian, that, that despite this level of cooling, at this stage, thermal runaway is advanced enough to produce large volumes of gas, which is now igniting. So, Steve, we've now reached a point where the electrical supply to the vehicle has been isolated um, and the, f the fire itself has been generated by a failure in, in the integrity of the battery. Um, we've got cooling in place. Um, do you have any further concerns or queries from a scientific aspect around the tactics that have been employed? Uh, yeah, it would certainly be useful to get Paul's opinion on a couple of the areas because I'm, I'm pretty sure people will be asking these questions. Um, so firstly, we, we have a high vol voltage electrical system and we're applying volumes of water. So does this pose an electrical risk to crews? Uh, that would be the first question. Secondly, we've seen that the gases are clearly flammable, but um, is there a risk of this flammability progressing to a more explosive risk? And thirdly, our tactical plan clearly um, will produce large volumes of water runoff uh, with some level of contamination. But what is the level of contamination from this specific car fire? Is the water any more contaminated than a standard car fire, for example? Paul, can we come back to you now, please? Um, so just picking up on some of the points that Steve has made, um, in this particular scenario, is there actually a risk to crews of electrocution from the high voltage battery? There is no risk of electrocution according to the most recent um, investigations and research. The chances, that, well, there, there will not be electrical current passing up the water to the hose, for example. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so what about the environment? Is there an increased risk from the water runoff in this situation? Surely it's no worse than a normal car fire. To a certain, to, well, to a large extent, it's comparable to a normal car fire. The biggest uh, contamination is going to be from the plastics, etc. Um, but an additional contaminant that you don't find with conventional vehicles is heavy metals. For example, nickel, manganese, cobalt. And these could be at levels many times the legal requirements. So what about a gas ignition or an explosion? Yes, absolutely. There have been vapour cloud explosions in grid-scale battery energy storage systems, which are enclosed, of course. But there's also been deflagrations involving, for example, electric buses in the outside, just parked in a, an open-air car park. Deflagration can happen under the right conditions. And at the moment, we are not awfully sure about all of the characteristics of these vapour clouds. For example, we we believe that the lower explosion limit is between 6 and 11%, but we're not certain. There's a lot of research to be done. And we must bear in mind that, for example, in America, in Arizona in 2019, four first responders were badly injured, two of them severely injured by a vapor clouding explosion involving a battery energy storage system. And sadly, in April of this year, two Chinese firefighters were killed in an explosion of a lithium-ion battery energy storage system on a shopping mall, on the roof of a shopping mall. So be, you know, be aware you can find lithium-ion batteries in some very odd places. So the crews have now brought the fire under control. Is that it? Is the incident over? 
Uh, no, far from over, but but in a much more controlled state. So the the, the, the plan then is to continually uh, monitor and cool for a period of time, and, and to put a timeline on it. I think the initial call was around about six seven in the evening. Um, by ten o'clock, uh, we'd got this flaming combustion under control. Uh, and we've managed to get a significant amount of cooling on that battery to stop the thermal runaway. About 10 o'clock in the evening, the cooling ceased, and then we had a period of two hours where we um, checked the temperatures, but with no cooling, to see if the, the, the battery temperatures is going in the right direction or the wrong direction. So when we arrived, uh, battery temperature was round about 140 degrees with the thermal image camera underneath. Uh, by 10 o'clock, uh, it was about half that, it was 70 degrees, uh, and, and by midnight, a further inspection had, uh, showed it was uh, 50 degrees. Um, so it was decided at this point that the owner would keep watch on the car. It would temporarily hand it over to him while the crews left, and we came back at 3 o'clock in the morning to re-inspect, uh, and we had 30 degree temperature, and then we came back again at 7 in the morning, and we had a 5 degree um, temperature. So we were, we were happy that everything was moving in the right direction, but still, in the back of our minds, what, what if this starts going in the other direction? So a, a significant handover to the uh, owner to just explain that there was the potential risk for this to start going back in the wrong direction. Thanks, Steve. That's a really useful case study. Um, I think there's uh, lessons that everybody can learn from that particular incident. Yeah. Paul, can we come back to you now, if we may? So, We've seen some of the risks that um, firefighters are presented with by lithium ion batteries. You've done some extensive research on the subject. Can we dig a little bit deeper if we may? Um, and can you expand on your research, please? Okay, so the experiments I'm gonna show you involve electric vehicle modules. And there's 24 of these modules in a particular electric vehicle. Now this is nail penetration. It doesn't matter what the abuse form is. What you're going to see can happen with overcharging, with overheating, etc. Now, what happened there was the ejection of the heavy metal particles. And now we're getting the white vapor cloud. We, we, we're not sure how much of this vapor cloud we get, but estimates are around a uh, thousand liters per kilowatt hour. Now, notice that it's lighter than air. It's buoyant. It's filling the container up from the roof downwards. We were trying to ignite this vapor cloud, but as it turns out, we were below the lower explosion limit. So you can see that the vapor cloud is filling and slowly but surely moving along the roof. Now, what you will also start to see shortly is that there's a heavier than air vapor cloud starts to form. And both vapor clouds are formed, but the relative amounts depend upon, for example, the, the chemistry of the lithium battery. We're not awfully sure what else it depends upon. And now you can see the heavier than air vapor cloud being formed. The module at this point is not on fire and the temperature of the module is only around about 250 degrees centigrade. Now, once the module ignites, you will see that the vapor clouds reverse. Now imagine this in a home, in a bedroom of a terraced house next to the hot water tank, which is where I've seen domestic systems. There goes the module igniting, and you'll see all of those gases reversing direction as they're consumed by the fire. So this is what happens when the vapor cloud does not ignite immediately. Okay, this is overcharging a module. So for example, if you're charging your electric vehicle and something happens, you can see the gases coming off. And in this case, the white vapor ignites immediately and it disappears. It's replaced by a very thin fume. But what you can see of fragments being blown off, and also little bits of white metal, which is molten aluminium. And this is just one module, remember. There's 24 of these in a, a, a relatively small electric vehicle. Once the vapor cloud has been consumed, then what you then see is the plastics burning, and then you get a conventional inky, thick black smoke. Again, this is overcharge, single module, and you can see that when the vapor cloud burns, there's a very thin fume, or relatively thin fume. And so it's not just in electric vehicles you're going to see 
fires involving lithium batteries. But as I've said, increasingly in homes, as well as businesses, factories, etc. And it's to best to be aware of not just the toxic effects should you face a vapor cloud, but also the potential for explosion and fire. Thanks, Paul. That's that's very interesting. Uh, your your research is essential to the safety of firefighters. So thank you very much. That leads us nicely on to road traffic incidents involving electric vehicles. John, can we bring you in here, please? A gentleman called Kurt Vormacher has produced a global study where he's invited uh, responses from fire and rescue service and emergency personnel around the world. And he's sort of looked at the amount of training that is out there that fire and rescue services have done and specifically how trained they are to deal with these type of incidences. And like we've said earlier, we're still very much in the infancy with this. We're still on that learning journey. So we get to sort of some solutions that we can, we can work across a series of, of situations. Um, and the, what the, the study has said is that we are we are still across the world learning about these vehicles. Um, and the type of training that's, that's currently being taken place, it tends to be more computerized training, less sort of hands-on and sort of awareness training, actually looking at these components as such. So it's something where there's a, certainly a lot of work to be done in this area to help prepare crews when dealing with these, these vehicles. Thanks, John. Can you talk us through some of the considerations for firefighters when they're attending a road traffic collision involving an electric vehicle? For example, how would they identify if it was a hybrid or electric vehicle? Yes, certainly. So um, as the profile of vehicles is changing across our networks, the first sort of key bit of advice what we're trying to tell crews when they respond in the early stages of the incident is that we should assume that the vehicle has lithium batteries. It is alternately a fuel vehicle um, until we get more information to, to rule it out otherwise. So we should already start to think about these hazards. Um, there's lots of ways to identify vehicles now. Some of them just in, in terms of using crash recovery systems with number plate recognition. Uh, we can also, some of these alternative fuel vehicles have sort of key themes in terms of like the badges being embossed or outlined in like a blue color. Uh, there's lots of um, other aspects where you've got QR codes within vehicles now. Um, there may be no exhaust in the rear of the vehicles. Um, signifying that it's an all electric vehicle or it might be a plastic exhaust um, and it's signifying it's more of a hydrogen fuel cell. Also, when you go inside and look at the instrument cluster, it tends to be more of a digitalized look and um, tends to have more of a charging sort of power reading or level of charge. And we're looking for that sort of ready or standby mode indicator. So we can first identify that these type of vehicles are going to be powered by a traction battery of lithium batteries. Thanks, John. So these are things that should be looked for during the initial scene and vehicle assessments. I also believe you've got some tips on how we might categorise incidents involving hybrid and electric vehicles. Can you elaborate? Yeah, um, so what we've been advocating for the UKRO and the education that we've been giving out to teams um, is that we're trying to categorise each collision into a light collision, a medium collision or a severe collision. And the differences, as we talked about, that all will present different challenges to emergency responders when they come on scene. So, for instance, a light collision, we're looking at the vehicle, so there might be minimal sort of crumple damage and panel damage from the collision. But the key thing to think about is that the SRS systems have not deployed, they've not become active. So it's a very small impact, low speed. Um, but this does present some other hazards and challenges to rescues when we come on. Um, when we talk about a medium and kind of categorize a medium collision damage, the difference is you've got slightly more uh, panel damage, collision damage, uh, collision zones tend to be sort of more debris falling away from them. But the key thing is the SRS systems have activated. So we've got airbags have been deployed, pretensioners have been activated as well. Okay, so again, that's we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, and the lastly, the severe one is when we've got severe collision damage high forces involved in the collision, and we've got contact or, or the collision damage has penetrated the lithium batteries. Again, um, and we'll talk about once we identify those different types of categories and talk about our initial considerations and actions that we can put in place for crews when we're responding to those different vehicle categories. What about the tactical considerations? How do they align to your three categories? So, so the key thing is that early identi identification and looking at which collision damage we, we've got in play at that scenario. Um, so we always consider a, a safe approach. 
but think about the vehicle direction of travel, where it's been coming from and to, and look at the, the way the wheels are, are angled and where they're pointing to, and then we'll try and make our initial approach on the safe side of the vehicle. So if it's going to continue to move forward, uh, then we're going to approach away from it. And the big, big risk with that light collision is that we get a vehicle that appears to be quiet and not moving and appears to be dead, but actually is still very much alive. The ready indicator, the green light or the green symbol showing that's in standby mode is, is, is alert. And our key things or key tactics we should be doing is trying to protect crews from that unexpected vehicle movement. So first approach from the safe side, side on, and then trying to get access to put that vehicle in park and apply that handbrake. That can be a, a P push button, uh, it can be a lever or can just be an old fashioned sort of pull handle lever. And then we want to try and chock with the high level chocks or four wheels to prevent any um, unexpected vehicle movement. That's the kind of key tactics we're looking at from a light. Then we're going to start to think about our extrication, the scenario and what we can do. Um, some services have started to adopt communication signage or visual signage, which are magnetics um, signs that can go on there. So as more and more emergency personnel arrive on scene, there's another cue as well as, as well as briefing that this vehicle has got um, these hazards associated with it. Um, when we talk about a medium uh, collision vehicle, the airbags have deployed. That's actually a good thing for, for rescuers. Um, from that collision point, the airbags are deployed and that also opens the relays within that battery management system. Um, so relatively speaking, this is a good sign for emergency responders. So it already should start that shutdown phase and start to be a less of a, a risk for us. Um, when we go on scene, it's, it's absolutely important that we apply that due diligence just in case things aren't working as expected and we make sure it's, it's very safe. So again, we're gonna go straight into making sure all vehicles are chopped, taken out of any unexpected vehicle movements. And then we're gonna to start to work on our shutdown procedure. Um, so the shutdown procedure, what we're trying to advocate is the fact that we take any movement out, we utilise those electrics to assist us with our extrications, because a lot of these vehicles will have automated locks, uh, tailgate locks will all be automated, all be electric. So as soon as we isolate the electrics, um, that will then lock everything in place that can hamper us during the later stages of the extrication. So try and utilise those electrics to best assist us so we, we can bring everything in play and make the access we require. And then once we've, we've established that, then we're going to power down the ignition and we're going to remove the key fob at least five metres away from the vehicle. Um, now, some of these modern vehicles now are also linked up to uh, people's uh, driver's phones, okay, smartphones. So just be careful, treat that mobile phone like a, a fob as well. So we're trying to take it to a secure place in the appliance. Um, so some services have gone down the route of using uh, special pouches to stop sending the signal. But anything we can do at least five meters away and then we're going to dis try and locate identify where that low voltage battery is and try and disconnect the low voltage and in turn then that manages the high voltage okay that again opens and relays if they've not already been opened in a light vehicle scenario and then that will start to um that residual drain down time start to de-energize that high voltage battery pack making it a lot safer for emergency responders on the scene and the, the last category is that severe um, and what we should be considering or, or be aware of what we've just seen in that video that, that Paul has gone through in that case there that Steve's aware of, when the collision damage has come into contact with the lithium batteries and, and or penetrated the, those batteries, and we can start to sort of start to expect that that vehicle may start to go into a thermal runaway. Okay, so that might change our tactics in terms of treating it more as a car fire as opposed to being a standard extrication. So we're going to be looking at different PPEs, different control measures, and more of a snatch rescue approach for those, those casualties involved in that vehicle. Thanks, John. Really useful guidance. Information relating to the three vehicle collision categories can be found on the UK Aero Academy site. It's also worth advocating the use of gas monitors at incidents involving high voltage batteries. This is something that has been raised nationally through operational learning thanks to the great work Scott and his team do. The information John has provided emphasises why it is so important to gather information before using rescue tools. It also further illustrates the importance of mobile data terminals and the information they provide firefighters at the scene of an incident. Matt, can we come to you now? We've seen some of the challenges that are presented by lithium-ion batteries. In a wider context, how is the NFCC dealing with these risks? 
Okay, so the National Fire Chiefs Council are engaging um, across a wide range of stakeholders, uh, including um, various government departments, uh, the uh, private sector in terms of manufacturers, um, as well as sort of academia and, and, and research providers. And what we're seeking to do is to try and bring that information together into kind of one place um, when it comes to the fire and rescue service um, response so that we have sort of consistent messaging and we are gathering um, information and uh, you know putting together a, a plan in a, a kind of consistent way. There are a lot of fire and rescue services out there at the moment uh, doing some really good work um, doing sort of research and development uh, under their own steam and, and, and that's to be commended um, but what the National Fire Chiefs Council want to do now is to sort of um, bring that together and uh, have a sort of coordinated approach to um, research and development. For example, there are a number of um, technologies out there at the moment that uh, claim to be able to uh, you know, assist us in the way that we um, respond to tackling these sorts of incidents. Um, but I think what we need to do is to look at the problem in the round and to bring some of those technologies together and see how they can be used in partnership with one another um, to give ourselves kind of a range of tactical options that will help uh, our colleagues to deliver the safest and most effective response they can. Thanks, Matt. Are there any specific areas of concern? I think at the moment, um, what when, when we talk about concern, I just want to sort of contextualise that. So we recognise as the National Fire Chiefs Council that you know, lithium-ion batteries are here to stay. They're an essential part of our daily lives and they're actually a really good thing for things like sustainability and uh, the way we, we, we manage uh, the problems associated with um, sort of energy consumption at the moment, I suppose, and energy storage. Um, but in terms of some of the problems we face, I think I think the greatest risk to us is, is where it's hidden. So we've talked today a lot about electric vehicles. Now, information gathering is important, as we've heard. Um, and by and large, it, it probably will be fairly obvious that an electric vehicle is involved if, if um, crews out there are doing sort of due diligence in terms of their information gathering. I think the bit that concerns us is the um, environments in which the use of lithium ion batteries are hidden. So Paul referred earlier to, um, you know, perhaps do it yourself, domestic best systems uh, in people's houses. Um, not unreasonably, crews would probably attend uh, fires in domestic properties at the moment, not really uh, you know, thinking of, of, of lithium ion as a risk. Um, but actually, as, as we go forward and as the sort of prevalence of lithium ion in our daily lives sort of exponentially increases, that's going to be a, a more significant risk and something that we now need to sort of keep at the back of our mind and be, be engaging with uh, property owners on um, in terms of asking some of those questions. And that's one of the reasons that national guidance, of course, has been written in the way it has in kind of making sure that um, we're taking an, an all hazards approach rather than um, specifically going down the route of, you know, in this particular circumstance, that's how you fight that fire, that's how you fight that fire. Because if we take an all hazards approach, then we are ensuring that our colleagues are armed with the information they need to be able to safely operate in the first place before they then get into um, uh, dealing with this, the specific issue at hand, I suppose. So how do we move forward? What research and development needs to be done? I think what we need to do um, is uh, bring together some some coordinated research and development at a national level um, as we move into the new year. Um, now, of course, one of the difficulties with electric vehicles and, and with um, grid scale vest systems we talked about is just um, how available uh, things are to, to be able to sort of test and research on. This comes obviously with significant costs. So what we're now trying to do is, is to pull together um, a, a bit of a research proposal um, that looks into um, uh, exploring more um, uh, some, of the, some of the hazards. I think a lot of that has been done, to be fair. If, if we look at some of the work that Paul uh, and others have done, we, we, we have a good understanding now of the hazards. I think where we need to advance our understanding now is looking at um, ways to sort of um, tackle incidents and to, to, to mitigate some of those hazards um, and that's kind of where we'll be uh, pushing our efforts. Thanks Matt, that's really useful. It's good to hear the NFCC is taking such a proactive approach. Scott, can we come to you now please? What part does operational learning play in informing firefighters about the risks from lithium-ion batteries and do you have the details of any incidents that you're able to share with us? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, so national operational learning over the last year has received over 20 cases um, regarding lithium-ion batteries. It starts from small power tool related incidents um, in domestic sheds through to domestic bed systems, um, like Paul mentioned before, and up to major commercial battery energy storage systems, um, like the one in Merseyside that was shared widely across the sector earlier this year, um, which took 
a significant amount of resources and a number of days to get um, resolved. When we receive these types of learning, we work with experts such as Paul um, before we move forwards and we take advice from him and then we reference it against our national guidance to make sure it's appropriate. As a result of the cases that we've had in at the moment, we've improved the guidance that we offer to fire and rescue services. And more recently, we've published a national training packages for all fire and rescue services staff um, to familiarise themselves with the hazards and control measures that they need um, to effectively deal with a lithium ion battery incident. In the near future, hopefully at the start of the new year, we'll produce a newsletter with a number of cases. Um, this will go to all fire and rescue service personnel or certainly be available to them for them to read um, and learn from these other experiences. As for case studies go, we've seen a number of different ways of dealing with batteries, such as the Humberside case study that we touched on before. Um, we've seen one from a different service where they've submerged batteries. Um, which is quite an innovative way and a, a good way to deal with it. However, crews, again, need to have that all hazards approach and need to be wary of the additional hazards it may cause, um, such as there still being a presence of toxic gases and the vapour cloud, as well as submerging those batteries and potentially creating hydrogen um, and other different atmospheres that might be toxic as well. More worryingly, Recently, we've seen um, incidents of lithium-ion batteries in the communal areas of high-rise buildings, um, which, if they caught light, would compromise the escape for residents, making evacuation very, very difficult. So we've seen a rise of e-scooters on the public transport network, such as the Tube. The Tube shouldn't have anything on it that um, is able to catch fire, so adding that additional hazard of the lithium-ion batteries makes it very hazardous for members of the public that are travelling on that network as well as the firefighters attending these incidents as well. Internationally as well, we've just stood up an international learning uh, function of national operational learning, where we take cases from around the world and contextualise them for the UK. We've got a couple of cases in, Paul touched on it before, the battery energy storage system on the roof in China, um, and also a bus depot, um, which was filled with lithium ion batteries, powered buses, um, and eventually I think it took about 20 batteries 20 buses with it and took a significant amount of time to extinguish and resolve that incident. Thanks for sharing that information with us, Scott. It demonstrates the value of sharing information through national operational learning. Okay, so that's about it. But before we go, can I just ask each of my guests to provide one key message for our audience? Scott, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks Ian. So for me, it would be no matter how small or how big the incident, sharing the learning that you might have from it or sharing your experiences matter. We see a lot of incidents come through national operational learning, some very significant ones that don't have any impact nationally, whereas there can be small incidents which um, firefighters, crew managers, watch managers deal with every day that might have a significant impact on the national guidance and the sector as a whole. So sharing the information is really important for me and that's what I'd like people to take away from this. John, over to you. Yeah, Ian, uh, so for me, the key message is about early identification and sharing that communication with crews. Uh, identifying those collision categories, I think of being aware of those hazards. And um, when we think about making that battery safe, try and think about disconnecting low voltage to manage the high voltage systems within that vehicle. Matt, what's your message? I think mine's largely one of don't panic. So um, whilst this is a relatively new risk, we have tried and tested methods in place to be able to deal with um, a range of incidents. And if you just take a minute, gather the information and think about what it is that you're doing, you can apply some of the techniques that you've used for other instances, incidents for a, a long time to be able to effectively resolve uh, these types of incidents in a safe manner. Paul, your turn. I think my message would be don't put yourself at risk. Think about highly directional flares, toxic and explosive gases. And finally, Steve, what's your message to our audience? My message will be don't be complacent, adopt an all hazards approach. Uh, we've seen a, a relatively be benign um, car fire, uh, in this case, uh, turn into something uh, much more developed. So um, keep your guard up. So there we have it. It's clear that lithium-ion batteries are going to provide challenges for emergency responders for some time to come. The NFCC is continuing with its research. National Operational Learning will endeavour to share case studies as they become available. 
The UKRO will continue to support research, share information and educate firefighters through the UKRO Academy and the Rescue Challenge concept. No one can argue that lithium ion batteries don't present a risk to emergency responders. However, just like any other incident type, by enhancing our knowledge and adopting an all hazard approach to gather information, we can increase that situation awareness. Obtaining the right information to complement underpinning knowledge will ensure that decisions are made to protect property and keep responders safe. Thank you to my guests for giving up their time. We hope you found this video useful. I am Ian Marritt on behalf of the NFCC and the UKRO. Until next time, stay safe.